It's a very nice introduction, and I hope I can live up to it. My um, problem is that uh, addressing an American audience, I'm always put off by your generosity, by the fact that you'll put up with just about anything said in an English accent, <laughs> so that I don't really know whether I deserve the applause that I usually receive. Um, but um, I know from Mark Henry's uh, words that, uh, that uh, at least I'm appreciated here in this institution. Uh, an institution with which I've worked over the years in one form or another and have always admired for the good work that it is, it is doing in, among university students here in America where heaven knows they greatly need an input from people who still appreciate the values of Western civilization. In fact, when the invitation came from uh, uh, ISI to write a short book uh, explaining what the, the West really is to uh, the skeptical student of today, um, it seemed, uh, when I first thought about it, I thought there's just no hope of doing this, um, that people are so distracted by the prevailing ethos of political correctness and multiculturalism and all the things of, with which you are familiar on the American ca campus, that there, will be, there is little hope of putting, implanting in the mind of a young person exactly what it is that we, who call ourselves West, Westerners, all have in common. What is our actual inheritance when it takes so many different forms and is subject to so much debate and so much dispute? Uh, and for a, a brief while, uh, let's say between the, the day between the first offer of an advance and the second offer of a slightly bigger one, <laughs> I did uh, debate in my heart as to whether I was really up to the job. However, ISI has its ways of persuading you, uh, and I finally agreed because it was a very bad time for us. Our postmodern rural consultancy had just lost a, a major client and not a, acquired a successor to it, so I had no choice but to agree. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I'm glad that, you know, that it was a commercial deal because that, of course, is part of what does distinguish the West from the rest that uh, we make free agreements to do things uh, to our common benefit under the uh, overarching benign influence of a market economy. And uh, most university professors are um, anti-Western precisely because they're not part of that market economy. They are beneficiaries of the state who are su strongly subsidized by taxpayers, always paid less than they think they're worth and therefore more than they are actually worth. <laughs> uh, and nurturing resentments towards the surrounding world of people who do things by common agreement for their mutual benefit, uh, exchanging money uh, in the process. So this was part of my emancipation from the university, which occurred ten years ago originally, but which uh, has to be renegotiated, of course, every year, um, because uh, that's the, the point of not being part of a university. You're in a society based on risk challenge and uh, free enterprise. Uh, and I'm an amazing example, not of all the things that Mark said, but of something else, which is a free enterprise intellectual. Most intellectuals are subsidized by the state. Uh, and uh, thank heavens I, for a short while, at least I'm not. Right, so the, the task that I was set was to uh, essentially to explain in the wake of the terrible events uh, of the um, 11th of September, exactly what the West is and whether there is some means of understanding why there should be such violent attacks and how we should uh, confront them. Uh, the attacks of the 9-11 were rationalized on both sides, both by people who were victims of them and those who had perpetrated them, uh, as an attack on the West. And they were expressly global in their meaning and aim. That's to say, they, these were not attacks which were focused on, for instance, the, the, the firms who'd, who'd um, taken up residence in the Twin Towers, nor they were specifically focused on, uh, on New York or even America. They were focused on those towers as symbols of America, and America in turn as symbols of a global 
uh, 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 and uh, constantly expanding civilization, which is that which we call Western civilization. And the attacks themselves could not be traced to any particular nation or state. Um, people have made the effort to trace them to Saudi Arabia, um, to Afghanistan, uh, to uh, other places in the Middle East, and all of those places are to some measure implicated in this great uh, event, but nevertheless, none of them initiated it. It, it was not initiated by a state or a nation. It was initiated by an obscure uh, organization based in cyberspace, Al-Qaeda. Qaeda means base in Arabic, uh, but it's a base that is based nowhere. It, it is express, explicitly global and indeed transcendental in its meaning and its goal. And this is a, a, a wholly new event, not just for Americans, but for everybody, to see um, such violence coming from nowhere and, in a sense, from everywhere. At the same time, the grievances uh, that are uh, behind the Al-Qaeda actions and the Al-Qaeda network are of no intrinsic concern to the majority of people who live in the West, certainly of no intrinsic concern to us in this room, uh, you know, we, we are not worried about the, um, what, what has happened to the legacy of the Prophet in Arabia, not particularly. We believe that this might be a ser of serious concern to people living there, of serious concern to Muslims, but they ought to be getting on with the difficult business of working it out. Uh, why are we implicated in it? So there's a real question as to why these grievances, which have their origins in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, should be... Uh, uh, aff affecting us in such a radical way and uh, casting such a shadow over Western politics and culture. So that was the thought, you know, uh, if I could write a book that clarified that, then maybe I would make some small contribution to um, the situation of all of us. And um, I can't obviously say in the few minutes that I have just what that book contains. Uh, and I'll leave it to you to, to uh, read it if, you, if you're interested. But what I will do is just give a very brief overview of the kind of things that I, uh, qu kind of questions that I was considering there and uh, the sort of thoughts that they gave rise to. So uh, it seemed to me that we need to understand three things. First of all, just what do we mean by the West? What is the West? Uh, most of the countries that are or places that are subsumed under the broad label of Western civilization, um, are, most of them are scattered around the world in large continents like Australia, America, and um, the peninsula of Europe, uh, which um, are detached from each other by large areas of sea. There is no, is no way in which we can identify the Western Hemisphere as the seat of Western civilization anymore. Um, and indeed, the Western Hemisphere actually is the Eastern Hemisphere looked at from the other way. So the, the, the geographical label is a slightly meaningless one. Uh, and we, ha we hang on to it largely because of uh, various um, apocalyptic works written in the uh, early 20th century by Spengler and Toynbee, in particular Spengler's great book, The Decline of the West, which uh, it, it sounds even better in German. Uh, das Untergang der, des Abendlandes, you know, the, undergo the da going down of the evening lands. It sounds really gloomy in, um, in German. Uh, and um, it is indeed a very gloomy book, which tells us that all civilizations have a finite life cycle, and ours is n no exception, and that the beginning of the end has already, uh, is already upon us, and um, uh, we've only got a few years left, but nevertheless, these will be interesting years. And indeed they were. Um, now, Spengler's book is a, a very great book, and uh, although mad in, and extreme in lots of ways, was an attempt to summarize all what Western civilization, uh, civilization had me meant at the, at the turn of the uh, uh, 19th century. And um, it influenced many people, and it, it was perhaps one of the principal reasons why people began to talk about Western civilization uh, as opposed to, say, the European legacy or the Enlightenment 
or um, the uh, uh, Anglo uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon sphere and so on. It provided a convenient label with which people could identify common interests among all those uh, societies whose origins, socially and historically, were the, um, the Christian establishment in Europe. And that is, in, in effect, what we all have in common. If you look at uh, um, America, Canada, uh, Latin America, Britain, the continental, continental Europe, Australia, New Zealand, all the countries which are currently grouped together as the West, what they have in common is that they are part of the European diaspora uh, uh, and their people and their institutions have their origin in medieval Europe. And um, medieval Europe itself is a creation of the Roman law, the Christian religion, and the Greek city-state. So there is a, a beginning to an answer as to why we use this word, the West, to say what we have in common. We are thinking of a, a historical process from which we have all emerged and which in s uh, some deep way still unites us. We still resonate to those uh, forces which first came into existence in the Mediterranean basin uh, in, in 2000 or 2,500 years ago. So that it was, it's necessary to try and understand what remains of that legacy uh, and how it manifests itself among us here today. Uh, the second great question and, uh, uh, that obviously we have to understand, if we're to understand uh, the recent events, is uh, the, uh, the, uh, what, what exactly it is that animates the grievances and the conflicts that have erupted in the Middle East. Um, and which uh, seem to be uppermost in the mind of the terrorists. And that, again, is something which uh, people have addressed uh, uh, with great seriousness. But it seemed to me, uh, when I reflected on it, that they hadn't really got quite right. Finally, there is the question, what we can do, we in, um, in the, the West, to contain or resolve these grievances which seem to be threatening us. Uh, the, the peculiar character of these grievances is that they ha have not found any solution in the soil which created them and are roaming the world in search of something, uh, some way of, of expressing their, their disappointment and frustration, and we have become the targets. Right, so those are the three great questions that I wanted to uh, resolve. What is the West? What is the nature of the grievances that have given rise to Al-Qaeda? And what is necessary for us to do to um, confront those grievances? Well, as I said, this, I'll just talk very briefly about what, uh, what I try to say in answer to those questions, uh, the third being obviously the most difficult, about the, w the West. Its origins as I say, uh, were in the Mediterranean basin 2,500 years ago when the Greek city-state emerged from the tribal organization of Mediterranean society. The Greek city-state being characterized by the fact that the citizens participated in the government of it. It was perhaps uh, the first enduring experiment in which um, the individual citizen had access to power, power was resided in offices which were uh, occupied successively by different uh, citizens, often elected to those offices, and the offices themselves were the bearers of power rather than the individuals that sat in them. That's a huge achievement of the Greek city-state, to separate the office from the man. In other words, uh, the office of, um, of magistrate from the, the person who's, who exercised its rights. And um, the, this transition you will find dramatized in Greek literature itself, in particular in the great trilogy of plays of Aeschylus, the Oresteia, uh, which, um, in which you see a family, the um, Atreides, uh, uh, trapped in a cycle of vengeance. Um, the gods had ordered Agamemnon, you may be familiar with this, to, to uh, murder to sacrifice his daughter, Iphigenia, in order that the 
w favorable winds would carry the fleet across the sea to Troy, where they were destined to fight to regain Helen. Um, and uh, Agamemnon acceded to the god's demand, the goddess's demand, in fact, and sacrificed his daughter, for which crime his wife, Clytemnestra, Iphigenia's mother, naturally did not forgive him. And when he returned from the wars in Troy, she, in her turn, murdered him, uh, in conjunction with her, the lover that she had meanwhile acquired. Um, Iphigenia's brother, Orestes, um, summoned by the gods to take, uh, in his turn to take vengeance for this crime of his mother's murders his mother, and so on. You can see that this will go on forever. Uh, the, the cause of this um, cycle of vengeance is um, the, not just the original murder, because the murder was ordered by the gods. It would have been an act of impiety not to go through with it. It, it is the deep cause is that this society is organizing itself purely in terms of religious edicts. What the gods command, the mortal must do. Uh, he has no choice in it. And yet the gods both order the murders and in turn punish them. One is trapped, the individual mortal is trapped in, in a, a potentially infinite sequence of crimes uh, by his obligation to order his life according to div divine imperatives. The, everything is solved at last when a, a new goddess, Athena, steps in, God, this goddess being the protectress of the city, who says, no, this, uh, um, let us, instead of the rule of vengeance, let us put the rule of justice in the place of it. Let us have a, a due trial as to who is to blame and uh, see if we cannot resolve this matter without any further deaths, uh, which is what duly happens. In other words, the city, represented by Athena, steps in and takes over, says that we will have a new kind of way of ordering uh, relations between people, which won't be that of submission to the will of the gods, it will be that of justice, in which we rec reconcile the conflicts between us by uh, determining who has done right and who has done wrong. And uh, the rule of justice is the city's gift to humanity, which establishes a new kind of order among people, the order which we would call the rule of law. Now, so that, that uh, beautiful parable uh, of what uh, happens when a city is founded in which, uh, in which offices take precedence over private passions um, lies at the origins of our civilization, I believe, and it is something that we have tried to build upon ever since to try and replace the uh, idea of a, a, an authoritative uh, divine order with that of a human order, which we ourselves create, through our own laws and offices, and whereby we regulate conflicts between ourselves without, um, without assuming that the, the gods are in charge. And this, um, that's one great input into Western civilization. Christianity can, was built on the back of um, the Jewish religion and the Greek city-state. And from the very beginning, as I suggest in this book, um, Christianity uh, introduced the idea of a division between the secular order, the order uh, of government under which we all live, and the divine order which is within us. We are all under an obligation, a, a religious obligation, to order our own private lives and our own uh, spiritual uh, progress according to the the laws laid down by God, but these laws govern a certain area, namely that which is uh, internal to the salvation of the individual, whereas the peace and discipline and justice which uh, reign in the city are human creations and must be uh, achieved by submitting to the human authorities which we ourselves uh, create and influence, uh, and all of that expressed by Christ in the parable of the tribute money, in which he famous, famously says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. And that um, division of the secular order from the internal imperative of the divine will it was uh, um, taken up by St. Paul and used to construct 
the uh, wonderful concept of the church as a citizen, uh, as, uh, 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 just as you and I are citizens, uh, one citizen among many under an overarching secular rule of law. And um, finally, Roman law gave the idea of the, uh, the universal idea of citizenship, which um, uh, St. Paul, being himself a lawyer, was able to adapt to the new religion. He created the notion that the church is a form of citizen, itself a citizen, which must obey the law, but which has uh, individuals as its members. And th in that, he was adopting a, a very important concept of Roman law, the concept of the corporation, what, the universitas, as it was called by the Romans themselves, um, the corporation as itself a citizen under the common, the shared rule of law. Now, th those ideas, okay, they're very abstract as I've explained them, but they're very relevant to our situation today, especially if we want to compare our legacy with the Muslim legacy. There is no such thing as the mosque conceived as a corporate person in, uh, in uh, Islamic law. Um, there is simply the individual, he is the only subject of the law, who, uh, who is uh, under an obligation to ob obey the entire uh, Sharia, the holy law, because it is the revealed will of God. There isn't really citizenship under this uh, uh, system of law, the system of law developed from the Quran, uh, and um, the absence of a church as an individual corporate person means that there is no system of authority which can really resolve disputes. Anybody can say, if he has been studying the Quran sufficiently, uh, diligently, he, anybody can say that, you know, I know what God um, commands in this situation, and um, that's what I shall do. I am the final authority in this. There is no way in which uh, the decision can be put in the hands of a, say, a bishop or, a, or at the last analysis, the pope, and in order to escape the individual responsibility and also have a collective responsibility. So uh, a lot of the fragmentation uh, of the Islamic religion under impact from outside can be explained uh, from that source. Anyway, um, just to go back to what I, I wanted to say about the nature of the West. I've given you these, these th th three origins, the Greek city-state, Christianity, and Roman law. But out of those, there emerged during the course of the Middle Ages something which I think is uh, absolutely crucial to our modern conception of Western identity, which is uh, the idea of a territorial jurisdiction. I know that's um, an awful piece of abstract jargon, but what I mean by that is the idea of a, a legal system which is the final authority as to what, is, what can and what cannot be done in a certain territory. Uh, whether it's the territory of a sovereign, you know, who's claimed that land as his own, or the territory of a republic in which there is a legislature uh, elected perhaps by the people who reside in that land. But nevertheless, it's the, the legal order uh, defined over that land which is the uh, our ultimate idea of, um, of legal authority. And this is something that we have inherited um, through a long process of, um, of uh, evolution from those original ideas uh, that I've just uh, been summarizing. And it's one which is of vital importance to us. The law of the United States of America um, is valid within this territory, and that territory is, as it were, the, the object of your common loyalty. You will stand by it and defend it from invasion, from the, from the um, uh, external threat. It is the thing that ultimate, ultimately that is the object of your love, the, uh, your patriotic feelings. It's that homeland which you all share with people of many different races, many different origins, even, uh, you know, uh, of course, different uh, local jurisdictions. But nevertheless, you share a common territory and uh, your final uh, uh, object of authority, final authority in that territory, is the law which operates over it. And I think this is very important to remember because in many parts of the world there isn't that sense of a final uh, 
answer to, to disputes within a certain territory in the form of the law governing that territory. There, there are territorial jurisdictions, for instance, of course, in the Muslim world, in the Middle East. Uh, for instance, there's a law of Egypt, there's a law of Syria, though that, that counts for nothing. But anyway, the law of Egypt still counts for a little bit, uh, and it, uh, it is a territorial jurisdiction. It developed at the end of the Ottoman Empire by the, um, actually by the British largely and the French for a bit, um, out of European codes of law, but never regarded as really legitimate by the Egyptian people themselves, because they, it is not part of the Islamic inheritance to think that law can be defined just over a territory. That law is, after all, an expression in this world of the eternal will of God. Uh, and it's not uh, confined to one territory. It is, a, it is something which operates everywhere and anywhere. And all these uh, codes that have been imposed upon the Middle East by the Western powers in the wake of the First World War, many of them, are uh, not just uh, without any absolute validity, they are also often conceived as blatant offences to the divine will itself. So that territorial jurisdiction, although it exists in theory in the Middle East, doesn't exist as the overwhelming spiritual fact that it is here. Uh, territorial jurisdiction has become embedded in the consciousness of the West and is part of what we mean by the nation state. Um, and that's what one of the theses of this book. The nation state is something which is much abused and vilified, especially by left-wing academics who think that it's the source of all the conflicts between people and so on. And I reply to that that no, um, the nation state is simply what the precondition of something that we all esteem as the final answer to our conflicts, namely this uh, territorial jurisdiction which enables people of different views, different religions, different uh, um, practices and lifestyles to, to coexist in a single territory and uh, address the law as their final court of appeal. That's the thing that will settle their conflicts, not the appeal to the to their own uh, particular brand of religion, their own particular faith. And that is something that, because it does not exist in Arabia, um, has um, led to the perpetuation of the conflicts and the schisms uh, of, to which the um, Muslim faith is permanently subject. So going on from that analysis of the West, then, you can see, I think, gain some insight into the kinds of um, grievances and, um, and conflicts which have uh, been festering in Arabia for the last two or three hundred years, but which have come very much to a head in recent times. Uh, the Quran is the final uh, seen by the um, most Muslims, and, and indeed by all truly pious Muslims, as the final court of appeal in any real dispute between people. The law of the Quran is not territorial, but um, a form of holy law which, uh, which expresses the eternal will of God. There is no such thing as a citizen under this law. There's no participation in the lawmaking, uh, um, no participation, participation in a lawmaking institution. The law is there eternally. You, you might need to discuss it in order to discover it, but nevertheless, you yourself can't do anything to change it. So the idea of the active lawmaking citizen that we all depend upon is absent. There is no such thing as a corporate person in Islamic law. Therefore, there's no such thing as the mosque conceived as another citizen that can be argued with and so on. And in, in the end, in any crisis, all loyalties are defined, not in terms of territory. You're not loyal to, to uh, your patch of this earth. Your loyalties are defined eternally in terms of your, your transcendental obligations to a life beyond this world. Your proper home is outside this world, in the paradise to which you might gain easy access by some act of violence. At the same time, there is uh, a, a constant nostalgia in the, the Islamic faith for something better than, than that which has been granted in this world. All the, because all the existing regimes are tainted with illegitimacy, 
uh, and seem to be a kind of usurpation of the original pure law that the prophet re was revealed to the prophet through uh, the Quran. Uh, there, there is a constant nostalgia to recreate that pure realm of, of obedience on earth and to uh, get rid of all those who are standing in the way of it. And it, it seems that you can get rid of them by whatever way you choose, according to at least Islam, Islamists think that, although most ordinary decent Muslims are um, horrified by that thought. So Muslims exist in a, in a tension between their natural desire for peaceful order in this world and the um, uh, constant call to and to uh, re-establish the pure realm of the prophet. Now, I talk a little bit about the various sects, and especially about the Wahhabite movement in Saudi Arabia, and the um, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which uh, between them went into shaping Al-Qaeda, and I won't talk about that now, but if you're interested, I do give an analysis in this book. Uh, and um, <clears throat> it's an analysis which, of course, is very brief, and there are a lot of other scholars who've, who have given more complete analyses. But I think the consensus is that uh, the peculiar circumstances in w which led to the creation of Saudi Arabia have exacerbated the problem. They've exacerbated the problem because, as the name of this Saudi Arabia implies, um, there is a, a blatant usurpation of the lands which were those of the Prophet, those where the great experiment origi originated by a particular family. It's the only state in the modern world which is named after the, the family that owns it, uh, the, the family of Ibn Saud, who um, originally co conquered it from the Turks at the beginning of the 19th century. And, uh, you know, this is a, a kind of a, a act of effrontery which many Muslims feel to be a, a provocation and um, uh, in particular, the, the um, Wahhabite uh, uh, mullahs or uh, ulama who, um, inst who are the principal guardians of education in those lands. Right, so there is an intrinsic form of conflict, an intrinsic grievance there. And the question is, um, what do we do about it? Globalization, as I argue, uh, um, insofar as I understand what it is, uh, is something which has impacted very uh, dangerously on this um, little corner of the world. Uh, the globalization has built, brought with it, for instance, the, the oil economy of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, that, that Arabia, Saudi Arabia as it's now called, um, is distinguished by the fact that nothing much until recently, ever went on there. Uh, it was, it's a place, it's an arid place, which, uh, with a subsistence economy, uh, in which, um, and a tribal uh, social order, uh, which uh, existed peaceably, largely, under the Ottoman Empire, um, but which uh, had an economy that was known for producing virtually nothing, except um, the occasional carpet. Now, discovery of oil underneath the, the, the sands, changed this completely. And because the um, ruling family has always regarded this land as its private property, that oil uh, was private property too, and has been used to, uh, to um, reinforce the, the grip on this particular territory, and made many people in that territory enormously wealthy, but wealthy without work. And, and you know, when wealth suddenly comes to somebody without having to work for it, we all know that the, this is highly corrupting morally. Uh, uh, that the, the, a lassitude enters the human soul uh, in these circumstances, which can be extremely contagious. So there's a, a moral disequilibrium uh, introduced by this oil economy, which itself is there only because we in the West are interested in burning this stuff. Uh, it, it's a a great um, error, well not an error, but a, if you like a misfortune of the modern world that oil has become so necessary to, the, to sustaining the kind of lifestyle that, that we in the West enjoy. In particular, you in America, and without uh, the motor car, you, none of you could get around. You know, there, uh, there, would be, there would be a virtually a collapse of all life outside the 
concentrated cities if um, if if oil were not being consumed in a vast uh, in vast quantities every day. So that this um that there is has become a kind of um, the Saudi the Saudi well, the Arabian oil fields and the American way of life have become locked together in an, an unbreakable uh, bond which uh, doesn't help of course anybody who has resentments about the, the family which is sitting on that oil and benefiting from it uh, and these resentments are naturally going to spread to all the others who seem to be making oil into such a valuable commodity in the first place then of course with the wealth which did does spread out, out from the ruling family because it enables them to employ labor to build palaces and so on enables other people to import goods and sell them with that come that comes a huge population expo explosion uh, and uh, the ex the population explodes beyond the capacity of the territory to to maintain to sustain it outside the cities so there's a huge uh, flood uh, uh, flux of people to the cities which grow enormously uh, and in ways which violate all the traditional aesthetic and religious expectations of the people. The Muslim city was a very important part of the Muslim faith. It, it has a certain appearance. It's, uh, for a, a pious Muslim, it's regarded as blasphemous for any building to, uh, to extend beyond the, 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 the high point of the minaret of the mosque, the, the city should be gathered together in little alleyways around the holy places which, um, as it were, uh, extend their fingers into the sky uh, in, a, in a permanent posture of prayer. All that was destroyed by the, the wealth and the modernist building styles that came with it. Uh, and um, one shouldn't exempt, you know, the modern movement in architecture from this the modern movement created largely by Le Corbusier, one of whose plans, which was half successfully realized, was for the complete demolition of the old city of Algiers, which he half achieved and because it was then a colonial possession of the French. Uh, he bullied them uh, for many years to demolish Paris, um, north of the Seine, and um, they didn't go along with this for understandable reasons. But uh, they would go along with it when it was just these mere um, primitives in North Africa they had to displace and whose lives they had to ruin. So you can imagine the effect of that insult on uh, people in North Africa generally. And you can imagine the effect of this kind of building and this kind of uh, urbanization on the soul of a sensitive architecture student in Cairo like Mohammed Atta, uh, whose thesis when he went to um, study in Hamburg was uh, concerned with the restoration of the ancient Muslim city of Aleppo. You know, so you, one should bear those thoughts in mind. These people's world has been turned upside down and destroyed by forces um, coming in from outside, uh, born on the great wing winds of uh, global expansion and, uh, and uh, free trade. So, anyway, it's no accident, therefore, there is this um, uh, conflict between um, Al-Qaeda representing the displaced spirituality, if you like, of the Muslim world and uh, the Western civilization representing the uh, uh, secular rule of law which we have been fortunate enough to establish as an instrument of peacemaking in the territories that are ours. So the question is what to do with it. And I think this is a very deep question, unfortunately. Luckily, I've run out of time. <laughs> so, um, and indeed, this, this happened when I was writing the book, too. I, I, got to, I got to the point where the deadline for submission uh, had arrived without having solved this problem. But I just have three or four little observations. I, I think it, you know, the present movement uh, among the uh, thinkers in, in America <coughs> Is, tends towards the view that we should democratize, do our best to democratize countries like Iraq, um, maybe even Saudi Arabia, which of course is a, a, tall store, a tall order. And that that way, the people would have a, sh a shared interest in the prosperity of their countries, and these, these uh, violent passions would gradually be diffused. Um, now, uh, there is a problem about this, that, that you can democratize a Muslim country Certainly, in the sense you can have elections, 
Uh, but the result of those elections will be a party which has decrees that there will be no more. Uh, and and the, the, it will be the party of the mullahs. This has happened time and again in the Middle East, uh, and the Algerian army, to its great credit, has recognized this and therefore prevented um, elections in Algeria uh, in the name of the freedoms which elections would destroy. So I think it's much more important to try and uh, re-establish some kind of rule of law such as existed under the Ottoman Empire uh, without necessarily going so far as to democratize. But I think it's also important to, for there to be a deep penetration of those societies by our security forces, not to govern them in a colonial way, but to um, allow them to, to shape themselves according to their own uh, native traditions and to allow the autocrats perhaps to re-establish some kind of control, but to penetrate completely the security um, the, the army, the police force, and the information gathering organs of, that, of those societies, and, um, and be utterly ruthless in confronting any terrorist threat that seems to be emerging there. And that requires a different approach to things from that which is, which is normal for us. We don't normally go in for assassinations and things, but it, uh, you know, when our whole future is, being, is under threat, we might have to think of of revising our uh, uh, general strategy towards such societies. But at the same time, I think we should ex exercise, and I say this in the book, uh, more ca care on the cultural sphere, more care not to offend people, not to um, not blatantly to go in with, uh, uh, with Coca-Cola and McDonald's and all the rest, and assume that, that just because people l seem to like it, that in their deep being, that they are accepting it. People are often traumatized by things that they nevertheless will, um, will appear to want once they're on offer. Uh, you know, like pornographic films, which you know, people, once you introduce those into an Arab country, of course they, people are going to turn on their televisions and gawp at them. It doesn't follow that in their hearts they aren't uh, seething with anger and resentment at being exposed to such a thing, which is undermining their entire spiritual uh, capital. So, uh, you know, one has to be very careful about adopting a pure free market, free trade approach to dealings with countries who, where the, the soul of man, if you can use that word, has been nurtured in, an, in a different shape from ours. So I w that would be my final uh, note of caution. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's so impressive to hear somebody like Roger Scruton address these kinds of issues. But I invite you to stop at Barnes and Nobles or Borders or the bookstore at the airport the next time you travel. You will find Noam Chomsky there, a shelf of five or six of his recent uh, rantings about how America got what it deserved because we had plundered and, uh, and ruined the rest of the world to such a degree that we provoked the attack and therefore we just have to go ahead and apologize for our previous uh, e e egregious behavior. Uh, to hear this kind of spokesman is what ISI is about and getting them to campuses where we can get students to think about the West, our culture, our values, and the deeper issues that lay behind the current issues uh, is what uh, we really seek to accomplish. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions and then I assure you there's a lengthier period for discussion with uh, Roger Scruton afterwards as we have a reception. But uh, uh, Roger, if you'll take uh, about 15 minutes with yeah, your questions. Sure. Is there a brief explanation for why Sunnis and Shiites can't seem to get along together? Um, I shouldn't think there's a brief explanation, no. Um, they, they, they split away very early. Uh, it was um, the fourth, the imam, the, it was the fourth in line from the prophet who, um, who was regarded by the Shiites as the true legitimate successor, um, uh, 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 Hussein, who was uh, murdered, or rather killed, at the Battle of Karbala. Um, about 60 years, I think, uh, or no, about 40 years after the Prophet's death. 
maybe even sooner than that. Uh, he was the nephew of, of the prophet himself. Uh, there was, a, there was all, always been a dispute, and this is one of the problems. It goes back to what I was saying about there being no such thing as a church in the Muslim faith. There's no institution which has authority. Authority lies only with individuals. So that the problem when the prophet died was who would have, who would inherit his authority? No church or mosque, so to speak, could inherit it. Um, and it was his father-in-law who inherited it first, and everybody accepted that because he, Muhammad, had singled him out as, the, as a truly pious man. But uh, um, the next, uh, as soon as the next one came on board, this is the, they were called Khalif, which we call Caliph, you know, means successor. Um, the next one was already disputed, uh, and the first, after that, the next three were all assassinated anyway by somebody or other who disputed it. And that was, you know, then there began a long tradition. But um, it just so happened that uh, Hussein was, um, was, was a holy man, and he, he was killed at this battle in which he was really behaved like a martyr. He went to his death willingly with his, with his followers. And um, it, 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 a kind of Christian element entered into uh, the, the Shiites as a result of this. They saw his, his, um, his death as an act of sacrifice, in something like the way that Christians see the death of Christ. And uh, probably uh, they were very influenced by surrounding Christian sects and movements in the Middle East uh, and shaped their religion accordingly. So this is a religion which has a, uh, an idea of redemption through martyrdom contained in it, which is not true of the Sunni faith. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I know very little uh, more about Islam than you have been able to teach me tonight, but uh, a little bit about the history of Christianity, and I couldn't help but be struck by the analogies between Islam, as you described it, and Christian Puritanism. Mm. And I'm wondering, is that a fair analogy, and is there anything useful that we might have learned from the ravages of Puritanism in, uh, in England in the 17th century? Well, uh, um, yes, I, I mean, <coughs> Puritanism is a very, is a current within Christianity, uh, and um, it goes, it's there from the beginning with the iconoclasts, uh, and it's always been, in this, you know, the, in the early days of Christianity, there were, there were movements of iconoclasm destroying images, destroying churches and so on, uh, 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 in, in which the same idea of return to the pure the pure religion, where you, where the, which is based on an unmediated relation between the individual and God, um, is the recommended goal. And I think that all religions exist in this way, as a, in a precarious balance between the institutions and the authority that they have, and this constant desire to reassert a pure relation and direct relationship with God. And when it, when that desire is uppermost, as it is in moments of crisis, the institutions count for nothing and the individual for everything, and, and it becomes a vehicle of self-aggrandizement, as it did, as it was with the uh, Puritans, and in particular with Cromwell, of course, in, in England. And would it be fair to say that in Islam, the puritanical current is the predominant one in a, in a, in a way in which it never has been in Christendom? Uh, yes, perha perhaps. Um, I think that, though, that, I mean, I, I, again, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, the, under the Ottoman Empire, uh, the, there were long years of, of, of peace in which the, um, the religion did retreat into the private sphere, although it was very important that people prayed three times a day and went to the mosque on Friday and so on, and, and um, the religion was acknowledged as a, a permanent presence in society, but nevertheless, um, it wasn't uh, dom the dominant force. There was all, it was also balanced against the office of the sultan and all the ceremonies that went with that. And there was a, te there was a genuine uh, civil society independent of the mosque. But I, I think one should remember that, that Islam suffered a calamity which Christianity so far has not suffered, which was the destruction of its culture by the Mongols. You know, the, um, 
the, all the literature and the, the literary tradition, the university traditions, were really swept aside by the Mongol invasion and never really revived by the Turks. And, um, and their libraries were destroyed. Yeah. You refer, I think, politely to the arrogance that we show in seeking to impose our democratic ideals on a culture that is totally, that's totally foreign. Mm. My father pointed out that Woodrow Wilson sought that and imposed it at Versailles. Mm. And he died before the chaos of what he had created in, in replacing small republics in the Balkans to mm. replace the Austro-Hungarian situation mm. that had maintained peace and freedom to a certain extent. And I think you're saying that the Ottoman Empire did the same thing for the Muslim world. Yeah. And are we, are you saying, and if you are, I agree with you, <laughs> uh, that we dare not impose small country democratic ideas on these people that we are now we have now conquered mm. because it is a total misunderstanding of what their history is mm. and it is arrogance in the sense that we say because it fits for us and it's work that it's ever going to be a solution to the Middle East. Mm. I, I think I do agree with the underlying thought that you're expressing, uh, uh, and um, it is true that Woodrow Wilson's uh, anti-imperialism and his desire to democratize all the small nations of Europe um, did lead unquestionably to the, to the Second World War, and, uh, and it would have been much better to have kept the empires in place. And remember that the Ottoman Empire was also dissolved at the end of the First World War, not just the Austro-Hungarian one, but the Ottoman Empire too. Uh, and it was carved up largely by Britain and France, in fact by two, a French and a British diplomat, both of them quite eccentric people, into little bits which they thought would be useful to Britain or to France, not to the local people. Uh, and this was a, a shocking thing to do. And Iraq is one effect of this. You know, Iraq is an artificial country that the British made. Uh, they put a, a, um, a Hashemite king on it and called him king, although he came from a, a, a tribe whose uh, geographical origin is outside Iraq. You know, they brought Shiites and Sunnis together who had never mixed and, and all, all the rest. Uh, and to put it briefly, Iraq is a fiction as a country. And the people of Iraq probably know this. Uh, and it is therefore very unlikely that, that anything that we would call democracy could take root there. Maybe if it, the map was redrawn and the Kurds had their bit, the Shiites their bit, and the Sunnis their bit, uh, there might be some hope. But even then, there are Christian minorities that still have to be thought about. And, and I, 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 if I had my way, of course, I would restore the Ottoman Empire, but then I'd have a great problem as to who should be sultan apart from myself. And I, <laughs> <coughs> it would be difficult. <laughs> yes, sir. I think the assumption that the uh, current administration is making, you, you dwelled on this very briefly, is that if the uh, individuals in, in, in the Middle East countries who were having our problems with are uh, some if, if, if the across the board distribution of wealth could be uh, worked out that, uh, that that would probably be the solution uh, if these people would become good citizens of the world. Mm. And I, I think if you're saying that that's, that's uh, an oversimplification. It's certainly an oversimplification. I, I have no doubt that, that, that things would be improved if there was a bit you know, a, a fairer distribution of wealth, or at least if it, if, if it were possible to, um, for 
honest labor to be properly rewarded. You, know, you would then get a, a rising middle class who would have an interest in stability. That's the, that's the most important thing that we should always remember, that in this country, it's very obvious that every citizen, with a very few exceptions, has an interest in stability, because there is a way of getting on, there's a way of getting rewards for your labor. Yes, but also to, uh, an interest in in the, in the existing social order, in keeping things in place, and um, you know, in m much of the Middle East, many people think that they have no interest in keeping things in place. They'll be better off if they turn everything upside down. Now, I think that's naive. People are, all, are never better off if they turn everything upside down. And they're probably likely to be the first to to, to go. But um, nevertheless, it, it, it's a temptation that we all feel when we're frustrated. Yes, sir. At the end of your book, you seem to draw two final conclusions. The first was fairly simple, those tyrants, which we've done with Saddam Hussein. The second one seemed to say to provide alternatives, which I didn't really understand uh, from reading all the rest of the book. It seems that our societies are somewhat mutually exclusive mm. to provide alternatives. Well, yes, I, mean, I think that the, the British idea, the, the good part of it was, uh, in breaking up the Ottoman Empire, that, that you could create nation states in that region if you had constitutional monarchies. Not, they didn't have to be democratic, but have a, a head of state who was a figurehead, but, but nevertheless proper government institutions that could, you know, with offices that could be occupied successively by different people underneath them. And I, I feel that we ought to be thinking again in those terms. The American, uh, Americans are hostile to monarchs for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, it may be that in that part of the world, sort of ceremonial monarchy could supply the, the gap in people's loyalties, you know, that the, the, the territory is not going to supply. And, and I feel we haven't given enough attention to that possibility. It seems to have worked in Jordan, for instance. Well, um, we did that in Japan after World War II. Yeah. We recognized the yeah. works of the Japanese monarchy or the empire yes. and instituted democratic forms underneath that, and that has worked. Yes. Well, I think that maybe the Jordanian example could work too. And, but also there is the Lebanese example, which uh, until it was destroyed by Syria, or Syria and Israel between them, I mean, Lebanon was a very uh, comparatively successful uh, Middle Eastern state in which, and the only one in which there were ex-presidents and ex-prime ministers still living ha happily in, the, in their own houses. Mm. Yes, yes, uh, I think that's right, um, and of course, if the oil, well, when the oil runs out, the problem will be really severe because you can't even create the fiction of a job then. Um, but you know, Saudi Arabia, many people think, is the real source of the problem for these these sorts of reason, and um, it is difficult to know in the abstract how the place should be governed. Uh, and w one thing to be said in favor of the Saudi family is that um, they do manage to stay in power, you know, which is quite an achievement. And um, they, they've obviously worked out some method to keep order. But uh, unfortunately, they, they do it largely by exporting their um, opposition. <laughs> and, um, uh, could, could you parallel? the uh, failure of the uh, League of Nations to enforce their mandates beginning in about 32, which really led to the assurance by Hitler that he could break all the rules and mm. take power. Could you parallel that with the uh, 
the, the weakness of the UN in enforcing the sanctions and various mm. rules uh, against yeah. uh, Iraq. I, I think there is a definite parallel. <clears throat> the, the, these international institutions, they, they tend to fail us when there's the real crisis, because by definition, that's what a real crisis is. Um, and unfortunately, because uh, all crises are possible in politics, they, they will fail in the end. Uh, and I think it's one of the things that, one of the lessons that should be learned from the recent events is that there comes a time where you have to say, I won't bother with the United Nations, you know, things are too serious. Uh, when things are back uh, to normal again, there may be, there's some point in a, a, a load of overpaid diplomats shooting their mouths off in New York about nothing. But, you know, when the, the world stands on the brink of destru destruction, you shouldn't do it. Uh, yes, I... Um was paying attention throughout your, your presentation, and uh, uh, you started out by saying that we were going to, to discuss uh, what is the definition of the West, and then what were the grievances uh, that mm. Al-Qaeda has mm. against the West, and then uh, what were there some things that we could do to confront those grievances. Mm. One issue I haven't heard mentioned at all tonight and, and discussed, uh, possibly unless I slept through it, and I, and, and, and I don't think I did fall asleep, but uh, this, this question of the Israeli-Palestinian hmm. business. And uh, I have read and I have heard people on television um, in the past saying this whole thing is all about Israel. Hmm. And um, uh, I wonder if you could give us a comment on, on that question. Yes. Um, I think that the, obviously the Israel, Israeli-Palestinian conflict is very relevant. Uh, it too is a legacy of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and decisions that were made then, you know, you know, nearly 90 years ago, by Britain and France. But it's interesting that um, I don't think this was a was mentioned by Osama bin Laden or um, any of the, his troops until the Western media got going on it. Uh, I think they, they suddenly perceived that you could feed into the almost unlimited reservoir of Western guilt feelings by dragging this conflict in. Because Israel is perceived, whether rightly or wrongly, as a part of the West. It's a bit that is an extension into the Middle East of, the f of forms of democratic government uh, and legal order which were themselves constructed in the West, uh, uh, largely in my country and yours. And uh, it, it, it you know, has very, apart from obviously its, uh, its behavior, it has some very insulting features such as that it has an election every four years and a free press. You know, and open discussion of matters which uh, should be determined by a single-minded decree of those in power. So it is a very vivid symbol of all the things that they haven't got. Um, and therefore it's an easy target, and it always has been targeted by Arab rulers when they've uh, uh, entered a crisis. Um, they've directed the hatred of their people towards Israel by way of deflecting uh, the quite equally justifiable hatred, in fact more justifiable hatred of themselves. If you look at Egyptian television, uh, Egypt's supposed to be um, law-abiding and, uh, and respectable Arab country, but if you look at their television, it, uh, every day there is some hour-long piece of anti-Israeli propaganda which is also deeply anti-Semitic uh, and uh, it's a no-holds-barred Goebbels-style show trial of the, of the uh, common public enemy. This isn't to say that there aren't real grievances, you know, which um, which have to be attended to, and um, I'm uh, I'm one of those who believe that the creation of Israel was a mistake. But then I, I think the same of America. But a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> After 200 years, a mistake becomes a fact, uh, uh, and. Um, 
you know, we haven't lived that long for this, uh, this mistake to be forgotten. I think we're getting on dangerous ground. One last question. <laughs> yes. yeah. I would like to ask, why do you think, why do you think that Senator <clears throat> was able to create secular democracy in Turkey in spite of the fact that most of the people were followers of Islam? I think it's a very good question. I, I've, um, I'm always troubled by it. And I think the answer is this, that first of all, he created Turkey out of the rump of an empire. The, you know, the, and Turkey had several hundred years of experience of imperial rule, which gave it the sense of a homeland or a metropolitan base, you know, the place where, it, where, really, where Turkey really is, from all those other places where it's not. So that there was a sense of the holiness of the homeland, which is necessary to create a nation state, and it was already there. There's also a shared language, which is not spoken anywhere else, because it's so damn difficult, you know, except Cyprus and places where you've got Turkish minorities settling. Um, and um, that helps. Uh, and of course, there was the, you know, a, a legacy of uh, secular thinking in 19th century Turkey, which he, he drew upon, in, in particular in the army, uh, uh, and um, which was a very westernizing force. And At Atatürk realized that that was the way to secure Turkey, to make it into a western-style nation state. So he deliberately adopted codes, legal codes, from I think from the French and Belgian uh, legal system, uh, and installed institutions modeled on, on Western practice, and at the same time ruthlessly uh, chased the um, Muslim clerics back into private life, forbade them from holding office, told people that they must dress in a Western style when they're in the street, you couldn't wear the fez anymore. Um, the law on hats, which tells them that, is, um, is uh, made uh, irreversible in the Turkish constitution. Uh, which is very good. I mean, you know, uh, as the law on baseball caps will be, will be here one day. <laughs> um, uh, and so on. So all the, all the things that may enabled Islam to reassert its grip over the public life of the nation were deliberately excluded. And, uh, and the army has kept a vigilant watch to ensure that. But it's, um, you know, it's always precarious. If, like me, you'd be disappointed that only 60 or 70 people were to hear this lecture, you will be reassured to know that during the coming year, 20 or 25,000 students and faculty will download ISI lectures in their dorm rooms or in their classrooms. So what we heard tonight will benefit a lot of people uh, in the coming year or in the coming years. Uh, I want to thank uh, you again for coming. And uh, Mr. Scruton, thank you very much for a wonderful thank lecture. You. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Right, so I now sit here.